The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. It is wonderful to be in worship this morning, and it's wonderful to be looking at y'all without the impediment of an eye patch. I am much better. Thank you for all of your prayers. Well, friends, a couple of things to make you aware of. April has five Sundays, which means next Sunday we feed you. So we have all church Sunday school. During the Sunday school hour, 9.45 to 10.45, we will be having a brunch right here in the sanctuary, and I will be leading a Sunday school lesson on lesser-known leaders of the New Testament. So, you know, the author of that little book near towards the back called Jude, Aquila, Priscilla, those household names like that, we'll be digging into them a little bit. It's going to be a fun time of food, fellowship, and then some time in the Word. So we hope to see you there in between the two services. Well, thus concludes the housekeeping. Let us turn our attention to the important business of worshiping, and let's do that by going to God in prayer. God, we come before you now to praise your name. Glad indeed to be in your house with this, your beloved family. God, as we gather in this place, may we come with open eyes and hearts, with receptive ears to your word, with hands and feet ready to be put to your work. God, as we gather in this space, we know that none of that that we just asked can be accomplished without the moving of your Holy Spirit, through which all that is done is done. So Lord, may your Spirit descend among us and through us, so that as you send us forth into this world, through us, in the working of the Spirit, the world might experience you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing. Because he lives. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love and forgive. Just leave thy throne. 
throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home, where is found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. Thou camest, O oh Lord, with a living word that should say, with mocking scorn and with crown of thorn they bore thee to Calvary Oh come to my heart Lord Jesus there is room in my heart for thee When the heavens shall ring and the angels sing at thy coming to victory let thy voice call me home, saying, yet there is room, there is room at my side for thee. My heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest and callest for me. Please be seated. morning. Our scripture for today is from John 21, 15 through 25. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt when he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death, that, death by which he would glorify God. And this he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He was the one who had reclined next to Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. So the rumor spread in the community that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but he said, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things that Jesus did. And if every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
She could sit right there if she wants. Yeah, she could sit right there if she wants. She's fine. Good morning. How's everybody today? Good. Today we're going to talk about a man named Simon Peter. Now, Simon Peter was one of Jesus' best friends. But before Jesus was crucified, Jesus told Simon Peter, you're going to betray me three times. Now, what does it mean to betray? Yeah, like say, I don't know who that is. I don't know anything about him. He's not my friend. And the night before Jesus was crucified, Simon Peter was questioned three times. And all three times, who that is I'm not a disciple he's not one of my friends then the next day Jesus was crucified how do you think well first of all why do you think uh, the Simon Peter Simon Peter said no I don't know him if he knew Jesus was going to be crucified and he was his friend don't you think he might have been afraid because if he knew something was going to happen to Jesus and he was his friend, he probably was afraid it was going to happen to him too. So after Jesus was crucified, how do you think he felt? How would you felt if that was your friend? Sad and probably felt bad about it. Um, but after Jesus is risen, he comes back to visit the disciples. And... Simon Peter doesn't go up to him and say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. He waits, Jesus comes to him, probably because he's just not sure how Jesus feels. And Jesus comes and asks him, do you love me? And Simon Peter said, yes, I love you. And he said, well, then feed my sheep. Then he asked him a second time, do you love me? And he says, yes, yes, I love you. And he said, well, and take care of my sheep. Then Jesus asked him a third time. You know how frustrated you get when your mom asks you the same question three times? Well, Simon Peter might have felt like that. But he says, Jesus asked him again, are you sure you love me? And Simon Peter says, you're, you're the Lord. You know I love you. Why do you keep asking me yes, yes? And Jesus says, well, go and feed my sheep. And he says, and then follow me. Now, he also gave him a little example. He told Simon Peter, when you were young, like you guys, you can go up and down those stairs. You can dress yourself. You can do anything you want. But when you get old, people have to help you. People have to lead you. You have to maybe use a cane. And they might not take you where you want to go. Well, that is a sign to Simon Peter that Jesus knows he's going to lead a full Christian happy life. He's going to live all the way to his life. But there's another example in this uh, scripture. He says, Simon Peter says, well, what about the one who is the reason for you being crucified? What about the other one? And Jesus tells him, you don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. If I want him to still be here when I come back, that's not, why do you ask? It's really like we would say, it's really none of your business. You just do what I tell you to do. Listen to me and your life will be fine. So we learn that who is, who is showing kindness in this passage? Jesus, Jesus is showing kindness. Didn't want anything to do with him. He came back and he said, you're forgiven. Take care of my sheep. And when he asked, well, what about the other guy over there? Like we all have a tendency to do sometime. What's going to happen to him? He said, don't worry about it. That's not your problem. I'll take care of it. And sort of shows that Jesus does not have the bad feelings that Simon Peter would think he would have. Okay? Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, hope, help us to open our eyes. Help us to be like Simon Peter, not in the way 
we resign our friendship with Jesus, but in our way of coming back and telling him that we do believe in him, we do trust in him. We didn't ever lose our trust. We just made a mistake. So peace, please be with us today in church. Open our eyes to what our, ma- our pastor is going to say. And remember, for us to remember that we love you each and every day. Amen. Well, what do you bring with you to church today? Do you bring thanksgiving and joy? Do you bring anxiety and worry, hurt? We all bring a lot through these doors with us. None of us comes in as a blank slate, but the good news is we bear our burdens with one another, and we bear each of those to Christ who cares for us even more than we care for ourselves. So friends, we're going to do that. We're going to go to God just as we are in prayer, silently together, then I will lift up a prayer on our behalf. People of God, let's pray.
Lord God, we gather today encountering in your word a question. Do we love you? Lord, I pray in this space that the answer in all of our hearts would be a resounding yes. That in this time, our eyes would be open to your goodness, to your mercy, to your perfect law and perfect love. And most of all, that we would be moved to love and worship by the grace, the mercy, the restoration that is ours in our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we gather here to praise you. We gather to proclaim our love for you. We gather to receive your word, your guidance. But Lord, we gather not as blank slates. We, each one of us, come bringing the issues of life, the issues of health. God, we come just as we are. But just as you are a God who sought out the disciples, even when maybe they were straying, you seek us out in the midst of our daily, ordinary lives. So Lord, we lift up to you all the ways in which we need to be restored. God, for bodies in need of restoration and healing, for those we know in hospitalization, in hospice, those we know who are hurting in physical ways, God, bring restoration. Bring healing any way that you will and bring peace no matter what we pray. God, we come before you now lifting up those who need restoration in terms of relationship and situation, who deal with struggles in the home, struggles in the workplace, who deal with all the ways in which people complicate things, O oh Lord. God, in these situations, bring peace, bring clarity, bring the restoration of our Lord that makes a way forward no matter how broken the situation. God, we come before you now lifting up those we know who have suffered loss. Great and small, loved ones gone, empty seats at the table, hearts that are broken, minds that are shaken. God, each face sitting here and each face joining us online knows many who are hurting. So God, we lift them up to you now, knowing that you care for them more than we ever could. So God, calm hearts and quiet, anxious minds. God, restore the joy of your salvation to those who grieve. May those who mourn feel you nearly. And may those who have lost their way see the next step forward. God, we come before you now in need of restoration for our own shortcomings. Some of us sitting here seeing the story of Peter hit close to home well aware of the many ways which we have failed you and others, the ways in which we have fallen short. So Lord, we come before you now confessing those to you. Saying as Peter did, Jesus, you know everything. So Lord, take the things to which we cling that we need to let go. Restore to us the joy of salvation. Thank you for your grace and your restoration and help us to move forward to follow you as you command. In the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So if anybody has good long-term memory and has been paying attention, that passage should sound pretty familiar because the first half of it we looked at almost exactly a year ago. The second Sunday after Easter, we were looking at the restoration of Peter. And it's a beautiful story. We looked at the way he dives out of the boat to go to Jesus. The way Jesus asks him those three poignant questions. Do you love me? Echoing the three times Jesus was denied by Peter. Making him both face his sin and the hardship of it while also bringing him 
past it, putting him back to work, restoring his position among disciples. But this year, as I looked over this story, something else kind of jumped out at me that I always miss, and that was the second half that we looked at this year. This weird little exchange between Peter and John and Jesus that I have almost always just glanced over. And the weird ending about if we actually wrote down everything Jesus did, we couldn't fit them in all the libraries on earth. And also there are some people who think John may be like an undead zombie wandering around out there until Jesus comes back. That's a neat little tidbit and a really fun way to end the gospel. But this wonderful conversation where Peter and Jesus have this deep moment where Peter has to face his sin, his shortcoming, has to kind of own up to Jesus, you know everything. And then when Jesus says, follow me, and he looks over his shoulder, John is standing there, and Peter does the most human thing ever. But what about him? What about that guy? Okay, you confronted me on my sin, now do him. And I love Jesus' answer because it's not some parable, super spiritual answer. He literally looks at Peter and goes, what's it to you? What do you care what he's got going on? You follow me. But also in this, I think maybe John, whose viewpoint we get the story told from, well, maybe he's doing a little snooping of his own. I mean, after all, why is he getting so close that he can overhear this conversation? Why is he trying to creep up on Jesus and Peter's very intimate moment? And then also, why out of the four Gospels is he the only one who seems to have heard this recorded it, or make it noteworthy. It's almost like John likes any chance he can get to throw a little shade on his good friend and rival, Peter. So in its entirety, what does this story tell us? Where does it reach us as Peter's, as John's, as, well, the church? I think it has a lot for each of us, so let's dig in. Situating this story, we know, is directly after the resurrection. The setting that we left out for brevity's sake is, well, the Sea of Galilee, where it all began, and several of the disciples, about seven of them by name, have left Jerusalem and went back home, went back to what they know, and they are fishing. And Jesus goes to them and says, Hey, have y'all caught anything? How is the fishing? It's almost an exact bookend to the calling of Peter. And they say, we haven't caught anything. And he says, throw the net on the other side and see what happens. And when they do, the text tells us they catch 153 large fish, which is oddly specific. And that Peter puts on his robe, jumps in the boat, and swims to shore. Which I never pass up the opportunity to announce how weird and senseless this little passage is because it says he put on his robe and jumped into the water to swim for he was naked in the boat. I have, I have went swimming involuntarily in a Carhartt jacket one time. You don't want more clothes on when you're swimming. But also, I've never looked at the deaderous debris and tools that are in the bottoms of most fishing boats I've ever been in and said, you know what? I wish I was just in my birthday suit for this. So taking off clothes to go swimming makes sense, but to put more on to go swimming when you're fishing in the nude, that's just odd. And then he gets there, and Jesus has this charcoal fire, and he serves them breakfast. He goes, bring some of the fish you caught. And scholars think that part of this, Jesus eating with them, is literally to show them he's not a spirit, an apparition, or a ghost, that this is his body resurrected because he literally eats food in front of them. And then he turns his attention to Peter. Now we look at this, first of all, and I think Peter even being in that place teaches us something about sin. Because notice, this is not the first time Jesus has appeared to the disciples. Peter and John go to the empty tomb. Jesus shows up to the eleven and then Jesus shows back up just for Thomas. Jesus has been making the rounds. And still, they've run back to Galilee. 
Not just in a geographic sense, but they have gone back to what they were doing before this whole gospel thing ever happened. Peter, it's his idea. He says, let's leave Jerusalem. Let's go back to Galilee. I'm going fishing. Who's with me? And I think that's Peter's way of trying to make it as though this whole last three years has never happened. Regardless, even though Jesus is alive and he has heard and seen, the fact that he blew it in such a monumental way of denying Jesus three times means Peter probably thinks he's out of it. This isn't for me. I might as well just go on back and catch fish. Which is why I really like cooking as a hobby in case this like preaching thing doesn't pan out. I can always flip burgers. So Peter had a backup plan, so do I. But no, he goes back to his old life and Jesus goes and tracks him down. Jesus, who had showed up in the upper room for them, who showed up in the upper room again just for Thomas, shows up chasing these backslidden disciples all the way to Galilee. Which goes to show that even in Peter's unredeemed state, it is not Jesus putting the distance between himself and Peter, but Peter. Friends, I think that teaches us something about how sin and mistakes and distance between us and Christ works. When I look back in my life, the times I have felt the most alone, felt like Jesus was the furthest away, when I get down to it, usually it was me who was doing something I shouldn't have and therefore felt like I was not worthy of His presence right now. Usually it was me who said, I'm dealing with doubt, so I just am not going to lean in. I'm going to build the distance. And every time in my life I have looked up and found Jesus standing there saying, just come back. Peter builds the distance, Jesus doesn't. Jesus chases him down, reminds him of his original calling. This whole relationship started with, hey, have you caught any fish? No, we'll try it my way. See, the results are different, follow me. Jesus, in calling out, have you caught any fish, when John is saying, I think that guy looks familiar, is reminding Peter of his calling, of his belovedness, of his belonging, of who he was before he fell, and putting that in the forefront of his mind. And then when Peter gets to the beach, even though they have yet to have the hard and good and beautiful and terrible discussion they're about to have, Jesus just sits down right there and eats with them. He invites all these disciples who have each struggled their own thing of desertion, of denial, of hiding out, of a lack of faith, of trying to go back to their old life as though Jesus did not happen. And he still invites them into communion with him anyways. Let's have a meal. And then he pulls Peter aside. And this discussion is beautiful. He makes him face his sin three times because he denied him three times. He goes, Peter, do you love me? And of course, yes. Well, then feed my sheep. Simon Peter, do you love me? Yes, you know I do. Then tend my lambs. Simon, do you love me? Finally, Peter just says, Jesus, you know everything. Nothing's hidden from you you know that I love you. And once again, he tells them the same thing. But reveals that indeed this restoration, this being put back to work, this let me get through your sins with you is going to eventually cost Peter everything. You're going to be led where you don't want to go and you're going to do this Christ thing for a long time, but eventually it will cost you everything. And it does. Peter is the one to start the very first church in the belly of the beast in Rome and he will lose his life for it. And the conversation is weird but beautiful in that Jesus asks him not, can you do this? Not, are you strong enough? He asks him, do you love me? Which I think is a fantastic kind of way of putting this redemption process. Because think about it, every time Peter failed Jesus, he was trying to rely on himself. It was always Peter's need for self-sufficiency or his illusion of self-sufficiency that caused the problem. When Jesus told him, get thee behind me, Satan, it was because he said, oh no, I know the gospel can't work like you're telling me, Jesus. He was trying to change the gospel with his own intellect. 
When he told Jesus at the Last Supper, I will never betray you even if I have to die with you, he's saying, Jesus, I think you're wrong about what I'm going to do because I am so strong, so committed, and so courageous, I can do this. Then he told Jesus, I'm going to stay awake in the garden, and we saw how well that went for him. And then when the officers showed up, he thinks, if I can fight hard enough, fight well enough, and stack enough bodies, I can get us out of this. Relying on his own abilities. And where has it gotten him? Nowhere. But what is his comeback going to be based on? Do you love me? He will go forth living not in his own abilities, not trying to regain his own confidence, confidence and courage, but simply trying to prove to the Lord that he failed, that yes, indeed, I love you and I'll prove it by feeding your lambs. And that's a whole different Peter walking away from there, relying on showing his love to his Lord, rather than trying to prove that he is something. Because this Peter is going to go testify to the very court that put Jesus to death and leave them stumped. This very Peter will be walking with John and a man will say, give me gold. And he goes, I have nothing but get up and walk. You were lame, now you're healed. That's a very different Peter. This Peter will spread the gospel to Samaria. He will spread it to Rome. He will be the first to speak to Gentiles and Jews alike to prove his love by feeding the sheep. What a difference that makes. And that's the big picture, this restoration, this redemptive arc for Peter. And it teaches us all the stuff it should teach us. Right? As disciples, failure's not final. Jesus knew Peter was going to mess up and he didn't fire him before it began. Your mistakes, your sins, and mine too have never taken Jesus by surprise. And that's good news. And Jesus can address every single one of them and give you a future in spite of your failure. That's good news too. But whereas Peter would have probably just liked for Jesus to wave a hand and fast forward through that really tough conversation, Jesus didn't. Peter had to face his shortcomings. He had to face the consequences of what he said. He had to have it put in front of him. Because a lot of times we would like to say, because I'm a new creature in Christ, I don't have to deal with those old temptations, those old labels, that baggage, the consequences of what I did. That's not this story. Failure is never final, but you do have to face your failure. And then also, this shows us that he had an uncertain future that was completely up to Jesus and his sovereign will to say, this is how you're going to bring me glory. Follow me. And it teaches us all of that thing about redemption and about sin and all of that, but then we get the weird part. Where Jesus is telling him how his life is going to end up, and Peter looks over his shoulder and sees John. His constant rival, and probably most scholars think best friend, John. Because these two are the two together who raised to the tomb. These two are together before the Sanhedrin. These two are together when Peter heals the lame man. These two are running buddies according to Acts and John. But they're also rivals. Because if you notice, John is always saying, well, I outran him. I saw and believed and he barged in. I was sitting there in the boat and said, Oh, look, it's the Lord. Peter was just naked and then dove into the water. John will make his buddy look bad every chance he can. And so Peter looks up after this depth of having to confront his sins, confronting redemption, confessing finally, Jesus, I can't do this out of strength. I can only do it out of love, and you know everything, so just fix it. After that kind of confession, he looks up and there's his rival, and his friend who has snuck up so close that he's the only person who actually gets to write this story down. This is the only gospel where this is. And I guarantee you, Peter was like, how long has that punk been standing there, and how much of this did he catch? And he asked Jesus, okay, now do him. It was almost as though Peter was probably thinking, you know what, when I fell asleep in the garden, so did he. 
When I was hiding out in the upper room, scared of what might happen if I were associated with you, he was right there with me. When I said, let's leave the mission and go back to fishing, he was right along in the boat, so come on. What does he get? And while I've never focused in on that before, it stuck out to me because I love this, because this exchange shows us that humans are humans are humans, and that the disciples are so not extraordinary people. Because here in the midst of Peter having to come face to face with his worst failure, being restored, getting the best news ever that God has got a future for you anyways, but also the hard news of you're not in charge of your future now, he still manages to compare himself to the guy next to him. Don't we as Christians do that? We all know those kids growing up who it seemed like they got away with everything, but every time we did something, we got caught. That's how Peter's feeling right now. We all feel like, man, sometimes the pastor is speaking right to me, but it didn't seem like he was aiming fire over there. I'm really not. I have certain people who are safe to look at, I know, and so I just do that. I'm really never singling out anybody. I only ever preach at my own sin, not yours, don't worry. Um, but that feeling of, yeah, but what about them? was kind of getting in the way of Peter seeing, but man, look at the big picture. Jesus chased you down in the midst of your unrepentantness, drew you to repentance, restored you, and said, go to work. You got the best news ever, and you can't see it because you're focused on, am I getting a fair deal in comparison to John? And Jesus' response, I love that human attitude response. What's it to you? What do you mean, what about him? That's none of your business. Because yes, friends, we are called to do this discipleship life in community, 100%. We are called to be disciples together. I do not like the idea of lone wolf Christians out there because I think you'll get eaten in the wild if you don't have a herd. But that said, when it comes to our actions and when Christ holds stuff up in front of us and has to address our sin, our problems, and move us through it to a new chapter, that's between us and Him. That's for us alone. And what he's doing in anybody else's life is none of my business, right then. But I think that statement, what's it to you, cuts both ways. Because as John is kind of creeping down the beach, listening, I'm sure he's either trying to, one, make this about himself, because John makes every conversation linked back to John somehow, or he's wanting to hear Peter get his comeuppance. Because he remembers the falling asleep in the garden, he remembers the denial, he remembers the sword play incident, and he goes, listen... This guy's about to get his tail chewed. Because even though they're best friends, who as a kid didn't stick their ear to the door when your sibling was getting chewed out by mom and dad? I wouldn't know because I'm an only child, but so I hear. No, he's there because he wants to see Peter get it. Or he wants to see if he's messed up and he restores him, what am I going to get as a blessing? Because if he gets redemption, surely I get more. And I love this story because as I dug into this last part, Peter comparing and John wanting to nose in and figure out what's going on, I looked at this story and I went, by golly, there we are. Because look, there is a group of disciples and Jesus shows up and in that moment they know, one, the resurrection is true, two, he wants close community with us, and three, he wants us to go to work for him. That is a good descriptor of what we strive to be as a church. Also, within this, do we definitely have Peters? Absolutely. I've been Peter plenty of times where I have felt like I blew it. I have put distance between me and Christ. I have tried to run, go back to acting and believing and thinking like this whole gospel thing never happened. And he chased me down anyways, made me face my sins and said, you've got a future yet, child. And I don't think I'm the only one. But then I've also caught myself going, yeah, but what about them? And I've also been John who was more focused on how a buddy messed up and what they're getting punished for than where is Jesus calling me? Because look at it, this whole group of disciples knows that the resurrection is true, that Jesus wants to have communion with them, 
Literally, they get an unexpected blessing of fish. That means their church budget is looking good. And Jesus cooked them breakfast. They just had a potluck. If the disciples in this moment were a church, they're having a real good Sunday. And still, they're like, yeah, but what's Peter doing? Still, with everything going so well, with everything that is amazing right there, they miss it because John is focusing on the drama rather than the presence of the Lord and the mission he's being called to. And friends, as a church, there will always be a pot to stir. There will always be something to talk about. There will always be a did you hear, did you see, did you know. And if we're careful, or not careful, we can find ourselves slipping down the beach when Jesus is working on somebody only to find we are missing that He is in our midst, He has provided for our needs, and He has deputized us to go forward on His behalf. So how do you get here today? Are you still wet from diving in the water to get back to Jesus? Have you found yourself feeling like maybe there's some distance between you and Him? Or do you feel like maybe you're pretty good right now, but you've had a harsh look at those around you? While each of us has a different situation and a different future, the offer of grace is the same. The offer of belonging is the same. And the offer to be part of of the family of disciples is the same. Because whether you're a John or whether you're a Peter or whether you're one of these dudes in between, the offer to grace is just as undeserved. The redemption is just as unwarranted. And the opportunity to serve is just as beautiful. Amen. Let's stand and sing together as we prepare for communion. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. unto the Lord. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. Sing alleluia, sing alleluia. Lift up your hearts unto the Lord. Now we'll sing verse 3. His resurrection sets us free. sets us free. Sing alleluia, sing alleluia. His resurrection sets us free. Here the same Christ who stopped at nothing to redeem His disciples. You may be seated, by the way. The same disciple that stopped at nothing to redeem Peter who had gone astray meets us at this table offering each of us redemption and calling us to remember what he did to get it. We remember how our Lord Jesus Christ on the night in which he was to be betrayed took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take, drink in remembrance of me. Sisters and brothers, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. Let's pray. Lord, continue to be with us daily as we remember the pain and suffering of the cross. 
and the glory of the resurrection. Help us to believe and to continue in the glory of your will. We ask you to support our thoughts and prayers as we study and remember the glory of that time. Let's please pray our Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This table is not a Disciples of Christ table. It is not First Christian Church's table. It is the Lord's table. All who seek Him are welcome and encouraged here. It doesn't work unless you turn it on. It's that time that we're going to get back in our ways, our offering, what we can, when we can, however you can. It's not necessary monetary value. It's personal. Let's give. <laughs>
has blessed these gifts. Lord, we're thankful for what we've been given and ask you to bless the gift, bless the giver. Remember, giving does not have to be cash. It can be you. It can be personal between you and whoever. Amen. Amen. Everything we do in the Christ-following life is a response to that call we saw in the Scripture today. You follow me. As such, we offer an invitation as representatives of our Lord, saying, if you have heard the call of Him to follow Him, and you would like to either make a confession of faith or follow by joining this worshiping body, the table is open during the hymn of invitation. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me. Go in peace with this benediction. As you go, go rejoicing because failure is not final in God's kingdom. But let nothing distract you from who we are called to be as disciples. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.